on World News Tonight. Trump indicted. Former US President Donald Trump has been indicted by the New York Grand Jury. What does this mean for the future of US politics? Find out tonight. Back in Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro returns to Brazil with the aim to lead the opposition against Lula da Silva. Sudden arrest. The Russian Federation arrests a Wall Street Journal reporter on the charges of espionage as the US asks for all its citizens to leave Russia immediately. And feline friends, India welcomes its first cheetah cub after 70 years since species went extinct in the subcontinent. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are watching World News. Historic and starkly controversial news from the United States is leading this Friday night on our broadcast as Donald Trump has been the first former president of the United States to face criminal prosecution. But the charges have not yet been made public. The indictment by the Grand Jury in Manhattan, New York, comes after a years-long investigation into a payment made by Trump's personal lawyer to adult star Stormy Daniels ahead of 2016 presidential election. A grand jury in New York voted to indict former President Donald Trump, two sources said on Thursday, making him the first ex-president to face criminal charges in U.S. history. The indictment arising from an investigation into hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels could reshape the 2024 presidential race. The specific charges related to the probe led by Democratic Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg are not yet known. The New York Times reported that the indictment will likely be announced in the coming days. A lawyer representing Trump said she was informed of the indictment but did not know when he would surrender. Bragg's office did not immediately respond to requests for comment. We're witnessing American history. Never has a former president been indicted or charged with the crime. And that's what we're seeing here. Nima Romani is a former federal prosecutor and the president of West Coast Trial Lawyers. Trump will be given the opportunity to appear in court. He's not going to be arrested. Now, he will be booked, which means he'll be fingerprinted. He'll have his mugshot taken. His attorneys, of course, will plead not guilty for him. I don't expect there to be any pretrial resolution in this case. And we're going to see the most politically charged trial in American history. The grand jury began hearing evidence in January about Trump's role in the hush money payment to Daniels days before the 2016 presidential election that he ended up winning. Daniels, an adult film actress whose real name is Stephanie Clifford, has said she received the money in exchange for keeping silent about a sexual encounter she had with Trump in 2006. The former president's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, has said Trump directed hush money payments to Daniels. Trump has denied having an affair with her. Federal prosecutors examined the Daniels payoff in 2018, leading to a prison sentence for Cohen, but no charges against Trump. No former sitting U.S. president has ever faced criminal charges. Trump also faces criminal investigations led by a special counsel appointed by the U.S. Attorney General over his handling of classified government documents after leaving office and his efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. He also faces an investigation led by a local prosecutor in Georgia into whether he unlawfully tried to overturn his 2020 election defeat in that state. Trump previously said he would continue campaigning for the Republican Party's nomination in the presidential race if he was charged with a crime. For Democrats, Donald Trump's indictment was proof that no one, not even a former president, was above the law. For Republicans, it was the culmination of a years-long political witch hunt designed to take down Donald Trump. The unprecedented move by a Manhattan grand jury triggered a wave of predictably partisan responses reflecting a nation deeply divided over Trump and his presidency, which ended after his failed attempts to cling to power culminated in a deadly assault on the U.S. Capitol. Supporters of Donald Trump gathered outside his Palm Beach Mar Lago property to show their support for the former president after he was indicted. Donald Trump responded angrily to the indictment issued against him Thursday by a Manhattan grand jury, criticizing what he called thugs and radical left monsters in a post on his Truth Social platform. The former U.S. president was investigated over alleged hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels. 
but he maintained his innocence and said without providing evidence the indictment was, quote, political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history. Trump previously said he would continue his run to be a Republican nominee in the 2024 presidential elections, despite facing criminal charges. Supporters outside his Florida home appeared confident at his chances. Trump remains the frontrunner for the 2024 GOP contest. For now, according to a recent Reuters Ipsos poll, he's got the support of 44% of Republicans. His closest rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, came in with 30% support. Potential GOP challengers on Thursday demonstrated the fine line they must tread to avoid alienating Trump supporters. DeSantis said on Twitter the indictment was un-American and a weaponization of the legal system to advance a political agenda. He didn't name Trump, but said Florida would not play a role in an extradition request to New York. Former Vice President Mike Pence called it an outrage, while election hopeful Senator Tim Scott said it was a travesty. Both are potential 2024 candidates who have yet to declare they're in the running. Less than two hours after the indictment, Trump appealed to supporters to help with his legal defense, asking to turn the outrage into support in an email. GOP officials and political analysts predict the prosecution will boost Trump's support and harden his supporters' resolve to back him in the 2024 Republican primary. Already in just a week's time, the Trump campaign raised nearly $2 million from small-sum donations after Trump primed a Republican reaction by warning of a so-called imminent arrest. Brazil's former president, Jair Bolsonaro, returned to the country for the first time since his election defeat that culminated in thousands of his supporters rioting in protest as a result. The far-right politician flew back to Brasilia from Florida, where he stayed for three months in self-imposed exile after he failed to win re-elections in last year's presidential vote. A crowd of chanting supporters welcomed Brazil's far-right former president, Jair Bolsonaro, back to the country on Thursday after he spent three months in the United States following his election loss. But the turnout at the airport was considerably smaller than expected by police, prompting one Brazilian cabinet member to call Bolsonaro's reception a flop that showed his weak leadership. <laughs> Bolsonaro never formally conceded defeat in last year's election against President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, commonly known as Lula, and has vowed to lead the opposition to Lula's government. The 68-year-old shook hands as he arrived at the headquarters of the Liberal Party in Brasilia and once there spoke in a live webcast saying that conservatives controlled Congress and that Lula's minority government would not be able to, quote, do what it liked with the future of our country, adding, quote, it is with great pride that I return. Late last year, the former leader left Brazil for the United States, two days before he was due to hand over the presidential sash to Lula on January 1st. He said he needed rest, but critics say he was trying to avoid over a dozen legal investigations he may face in Brazil. They include his alleged role in encouraging supporters to storm government buildings in January 8th riots that recalled the 2021 assault on the U.S. Capitol. Bolsonaro, who holds former U.S. President Donald Trump as his political idol, attended the Conservative Political Action Conference this month in Washington, where he questioned the result of the October election nearly won by Lula. He said his mission in Brazil was still not over. Russia's Federal Security Service, the top KGB successor agency, has stated that Jerzhkovich a U.S. national and a reporter for the Wall Street Journal has been detained in the Ural Mountain city of Yekaterinburg on the suspicion that he was trying to obtain classified information. Russia's FSB security service says it's arrested a reporter for the Wall Street Journal on suspicion of spying for the American government. And the arrest of Evan Gershkovich, a 31-year-old U.S. national, marks the most serious public move against a foreign journalist in Russia since the beginning of the Ukraine war. The FSB says Gershkovich was arrested in the city of Yekaterinburg, attempting to obtain classified information about a military factory without giving details or evidence. The foreign ministry says his activities in the city were not related to journalism and that it wasn't the first time a person had used a foreign journalism role as a cover for other activities. 
In a written statement, the Wall Street Journal said it vehemently denies the allegations from the FSB, seeks his immediate release, and that the paper stands in solidarity with Evan and his family. Russia has tightened its censorship laws during the Ukraine invasion, including prison sentences for people deemed to have discredited its military. It's also broadened what it defines as a state secret. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen arrived in New York on a sensitive U.S. stopover, vowing on road not to let external pressure prevent the island from engaging with the world after China threatened retaliation if she meets U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen greets supporters as she arrives in New York on what has turned out to be a controversial stopover. It is Tsai's seventh trip to the U.S. since she became president in 2016. Like those previous visits, it is not an official one because Taipei and Washington do not have formal diplomatic ties. But the U.S. remains a firm ally of Taiwan. Its support for the democratically ruled island bolstered in recent years. At Tsai underlined at a dinner attended by Taiwanese U.S. residents. We appreciate the U.S. government's commitment to Taiwan security under the Taiwan Relations Act. The more united the Taiwanese are, the safer Taiwan will be. And the safer Taiwan will be, the safer the world will be. We will work hand in hand with all our democratic partners to continue to firmly walk on the path of democracy and freedom. Tsai is in New York until Saturday when she will visit Taiwan's diplomatic partners in Guatemala and Belize. She stops off in California on the way back where she may meet House of Representatives Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, having previously hosted his predecessor Nancy Pelosi in Taipei last August. China, which considers Taiwan a renegade province, protested against that visit. On Thursday, Beijing once again registered its discontent. The U.S. and Taiwan authorities made arrangements for Tsai to engage in political activities in the U.S. and described it as a stopover so as to upgrade official exchanges with Taiwan. This seriously violates the One China principle and gravely undermines China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And China made its presence felt on the streets of New York with a large group of pro-Beijing protesters turning up to greet the Taiwanese president. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. Turkey has finally approved Finland's application to join NATO, putting an end to months of delay while also continuing to block Sweden from joining the military alliance. The Turkish parliament voted unanimously in favour of Finland's membership, clearing the last hurdle in the accession process. Finland has overcome the final hurdle towards becoming a fully-fledged member of NATO. After Hungary's parliament ratified its membership bid on Monday, late on Thursday, the Turkish parliament followed suit. Even before the session, the vote was largely seen as a done deal, after President Erdogan gave the NATO bid his blessing earlier this month. Russia's aggression in Ukraine has pushed Finland and its neighbour Sweden into NATO's arms as they both seek a defensive pact. Finland's 1,300 kilometre long border with Russia means that Moscow's border with NATO members will over double in length, one of the things Vladimir Putin has most sought to avoid. Ankara has been much more proactive in greenlighting Helsinki's bid than it has Sweden's. Political clashes with Stockholm have soured relations and stalled Sweden's accession to the Defence Alliance. Finns will head to the polls on Sunday, with Prime Minister Sanna Marin looking to hold on to power. Finland's parliament has already passed the vast chunk of paperwork needed in preparation for Turkey's approval, avoiding what could otherwise have been a months-long delay in the wake of Sunday's election and the electoral recess that follows. Helsinki now looks to wrap up the final details within weeks, well in time for a NATO summit in Vilnius in July. For the very first time, the South Korean government has made it public the details of North Korea's dire human rights violation. The 400-page report contains testimonies of how people on the northern side of the peninsula, even minors and pregnant women, have been deprived of their freedom to live, to relocate and to express themselves. 
The South Korean government is to reveal explicit details of North Korea's dire human rights situation to the public for the very first time. In a rare move, South Korea shared the contents of a report detailing how the regime in the North have been abusing the rights of its people. The 400-page report includes vivid testimony from more than 500 North Korean defectors who came to South Korea from 2017 to 2022. The documents claim that people have been deprived of their rights to live, to choose their religion, and even to relocate. Also accounts of public executions even for offenses the regime considers less serious. People have been sentenced to death for not following COVID quarantine rules or for watching or sharing content from South Korea. The regime has not spared women or even children. The situation was even worse for prisoners, many of whom are known to have died of malnutrition, overwork and physical assault. People's right to express their thoughts, their rights to privacy and to travel have also been violated due to strict surveillance. The authorities also conduct sudden checks on whether people are wearing the badges depicting North Korea's founder Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-un's father Kim Jong-il and even monitor their phone conversations. Some details in the report have been pointed out in the past by private institutions and international organizations. But Seoul's Unification Ministry says the fact that they're in an official government document in South Korea is significant because it reflects the Yoon sang yeol administration's determination to help improve such conditions. For the past six years, the annual report had been produced but not disclosed, and this marks the first time that it's available to the public. We hope that the release of the report will raise awareness of the situation in North Korea at home and abroad and lead to stronger local, private and international cooperation aimed at promoting human rights in the regime. The ministry says it hopes the report will lead to change in the way North Korean authorities exert control and vowed continued efforts to guarantee humane lives for the people in the North. The report was revealed to the press Thursday and will be made accessible to the public from Friday. The government plans to release an English version of the report as soon as possible for international audiences. Pope Francis showed a clear improvement after being given intravenous antibiotics for a bronchitis infection and could be released from the hospital in the next few days. The 86-year-old pontiff, who as a young man had a small part of his right lung removed, was admitted to Rome's Gemelli Hospital after complaining of breathing problems. Pope Francis's health is improving and he started working again after being hospitalized with a respiratory infection. That's according to a Vatican spokesman, who also said treatment for the pontiff is ongoing. All of this comes as preparations for Easter events were underway on Thursday. The Pope was unexpectedly taken to Rome's Gemelli Hospital on Wednesday after complaining of breathing difficulties. It's not clear when Francis might leave the hospital, though the Vatican said he was expected to spend a few days there. Italian news agency ANSA reported earlier that nursing staff were very optimistic that he could be discharged ahead of Palm Sunday celebrations on April 2nd, the start of a hectic week of ceremonies leading to Easter Sunday on April 9th. It's not yet clear if the Pope will be able to take part in the various services, even if he were to leave hospital by the weekend. The Catholic Church's faithful have come out to show their support for the pontiff. On Thursday, Francis tweeted that he was touched by the many messages received in these hours and expressed his gratitude for the closeness and prayer. His hospitalization has raised fresh concerns over the health of the 86-year-old pontiff and revived speculation over a possible resignation on health grounds. Francis, who this month marked 10 years as Pope, is sometimes short of breath and generally more exposed to respiratory problems. He had part of one lung removed in his early 20s when training to be a priest in his native Argentina. The Pope also suffers from diverticulitis, a condition that can infect or inflame the colon, and has a problem with his right knee that causes mobility issues. Welcome back. For more news, let's take around the world in a minute. Indonesia and Russia signed an extradition agreement with the Southeast Asian country's law minister welcoming a move he said should strengthen efforts to combat cross-border crimes ranging from money laundering to cybercrime. K-pop group Blackpink's Jisoo became the last member to make a solo debut with the release of her album Me. 
Blackpink's agency YG Entertainment said pre-orders for Jisoo's debut album consisting of two singles including the title song Flower surpassed 1.31 million copies as of Thursday. The Prime Ministers of Singapore, Malaysia and Spain arrived at the Beijing Capital International Airport for official visits. At the invitation of Chinese Premier Li Chang, leaders of three countries travelled to Beijing after attending the opening ceremony of the World Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2023 in southern China's island province of Hainan. Palestinians and organisations in solidarity with their cause commemorated Land Day with the protest at the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. Holding signs with messages such as Free Palestine and waving Palestinian flags, dozens marched through the streets chanting slogans. Fernando Alonso topped the timesheets for Austin Martin in a rain hit second free practice at the Australian Grand Prix after Max Verstappen was quickest in the dry first session. Alonso posted a lap of 1 minute and 18.887 seconds, nearly a half second clear of Ferrari driver Charles Leclerc. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We end off tonight's rendition of World News and the month of March with a visit to Kono National Park in our neighbouring India, where baby cheetahs have been born on Indian soil since the species' extension in the subcontinent 70 years ago. Thank you for watching and have an amazing night.